Well, we're about to celebrate one of the most powerful convocations on our calendar, and it's called the Festival of Sukkot, and I believe with all my heart that uh, I've established this for a, a very powerful reason, and there are a lot of people, especially our brothers and sisters in the Christian community, that may not think that there's really any kind of a need to celebrate the Sukkot. Uh, most of you know that it's called Sukkot, but it's also known as the Festival of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Season of Our Joy. And you've probably, if you've been in the Hebrew Roots Messianic community for any length of time, you're probably familiar with it. And what we're going to do today is look a little bit deeper than our common perspective regarding the Festival of Sukkot, because I want to address those that are probably riding the fence regarding whether or not we should celebrate these convocations. Le Leviticus 23 tells us that these are my feasts. This is Father speaking in the first person. These are my feasts. And listed with that festival is the, the festival of Shabbat. And if you understand what the word convocation means in Hebrew, it's a mikrah. And it literally means a public, listen to me carefully, a public summons to appear. And even in today's secular world, if you were issued a legal or a lawful summons to appear before a magistrate or a king, you would do that because you want to you you understand that you have an obligation if you fail to do it then your 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 own life or whatever could be in jeopardy how much more so if we're summoned to appear at these holy convocations and we fail to do so amen i've got some new technology here so shepherd john let me borrow this little thing and you know you guys know me well enough to know that i'm a tech midget and so if there's a lag here, just bear with me. I may have to go back to what I'm accustomed to doing, but we're going to do it. What I want to do regarding Sukkot is I want to give you uh, several different perspectives regarding what it is. And I want you to look at these perspectives and see if there is a legitimate connection to what Father's established in the celebration of these seasons and your lifestyle. The first thing that I want to look at is in Leviticus 23, verse 34. It tells us that this particular festival begins on the 15th of the month. Now, this is really important because if you understand gestational cycles, ladies, hopefully some of you men may one day begin to get just a little surface knowledge. Most of us don't. Brenda and I have been married 28 years, and I don't know too much about it, but I can tell you this much. If I want information, she tells me about it. The gestational cycles are important. Every seed planted has a gestational cycle. Galatians 6, 9 tells you that if you plant that you will reap in due season if you don't faint. Your words, your lifestyle has a gestational cycle associated with it. That word where it says in the Greek language, one, in due season is idios, and it means in your own specific time frame or your specific season. You will reap if you don't faint. How many of you have a promise from Yahweh? How many of you have a word from Yahweh? How many of you have been making declarations? How many of you have an, a hope or an expectation regarding something that you believe He has promised you? If so, you will reap if you don't faint by the wayside. <clears throat> now what I want to do, I want you to go with me to Le Leviticus 23. Uh, you don't have to turn specifically to the text because what we're going to do, we're going to pull back the covers and we're going to look at it from some different uh, vantage points that you probably haven't seen before, I dare say, and I'll just issue this challenge. I will challenge you today to not listen to what I'm saying and take it to, to heart without going back, investing yourself, doing what 2 Timothy 2.15 says. Study to show yourselves approved unto Yah, workmen that need not to, to be ashamed by rightly dividing the word of truth. You're going to hear some things this afternoon that you have never heard before. And I say that uh, with hu all humility and simply because all I did was sit down and take some dictation. And this is what I believe Abba wants you to see. To understand why the time frame regarding the 15th of the month when we celebrate this festival of Sukkot and the spring festival of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you have to go back to Exodus chapter 12. And there you'll find that Israel had been keeping a different calendar while they were in Egypt. And as they make their exodus out into the wilderness, Yahweh has them to build a cyclical tabernacle. Now, this is pretty interesting. This tabernacle is called a tent of meeting. And it indicates that at a specific season, a specific time frame, Abba has set an appointment. And that divine appointment is there for you to appear as he's called you forth. Now, 
This particular tent of meeting, if it is in fact circular, and I believe it was a literal circular tabernacle, it would have been in a 360 degree circumference. It would have mirrored the zodiacal heavens. And so what you find, there would have been a restructuring of Israel's calendar, and that's why you find Moshe saying, These shall, this shall be the beginning of months, okay? The calendar has changed to 12 months of 30 days, and they were literally going back to revisit a 360-day year, which would synchronize perfectly with a round 360-degree tabernacle. And what it would have done, it would have given them a very precise calendar. It would have given them a, a very more than an atomic clock. It would have also given them a compass. It would have given them what we would refer to today as a global positioning system, simply because if this cyclical or circular tabernacle is oriented to the stellar heavens, then I would know where I'm at by design, by the hand of the Father at every moment of the day. And if I am a mobile nation and I'm going to travel as I travel, I would need a benchmark, something that I could go back, a compass point, and then get the direction so that I would never be lost. The Torah is your compass. The Torah is your benchmark. If you will keep your focus on Abba's Word, you will never be lost. And so, based on it, as Abba begins to realign the calendar of Israel, he also re-emphasizes these holy convocations. I personally believe that I can prove that these holy convocations were kept all the way from Genesis chapter 1 forward. But Abba comes back and he re-emphasizes them here in their wilderness excursion. We find that in Leviticus chapter 23. And you find that these holy convocations, in particular this festival of Sukkot, became aligned with what at that particular season in the Middle East was an agrarian calendar, an agricultural calendar. Summer, winter, spring, fall. Most of the lifestyle we see here where we're at in, in this area in Salem, Oregon, you find that there are a lot of agricultural enterprises, and so people are very conscious of the seasons. They would have been very conscious. And it's also interesting because this agrarian or pastoral lifestyle simultaneously became intertwined or wrapped around, you can't separate the two, the gestational cycle of the woman. And Yahweh specifically instituted these holy convocations for the purpose of you understanding that if you plant seed as a man, if you release seed into the womb of the woman, as soon as the seed comes in contact with the egg, then there is an explosion in creation. Life begins at the moment of conception. And when that begins to happen, you, you see it sets in motion a 280-day cycle. Are you listening to me? And so we're going to look at that, and hopefully you'll see some things that you probably haven't seen. And based on the calendar change of Exodus 12, it becomes pretty apparent to me that the Hebrews would have had to have adjusted their calendar so that the lunar phases, of which are approximately 28 days, would have closely uh, been paralleling that same female menstrual cycles. And so you have to ask yourself, if they were celebrating a 360-day year, 12 months or 30 days, why 28 days here with the menstrual cycle and not 30? Well, if you go back and understand, there is a dark phase just prior to the sliver of the moon being seen, and that dark phase also follows the pattern of the death, burial, and resurrection. Yeshua goes into the grave, and then you see the the sliver indicating the resurrection and you see the same thing in the menstrual cycle so it's imperative for us to understand these things if we want to know exactly what Moshe is doing in Exodus 12 when he says this verse 2 this month shall be the beginning of months for you it shall be the first month of the year to you indicating that it had previously not been the first month of the year is that hard so what he's doing this is this is mind staggering what he's done, he has linked the festival cycle's beginning with the spring equinox and its end with what we would refer to as the fall or autumnal equinox. And if you go back and look, based on the stellar heavens, they are fixed and they occur right around March the 21st for the spring and September 22nd for the fall. And you need to understand why is that word spring equinox or fall equinox? Why is that word important? Well, 
based on what most people understand, at that particular time in the spring and that time in the fall, the night and the day are pretty close to the same time. How many of you remember in John chapter 11 when Yeshua makes this statement? Uh, this, I had never understood this until I was looking at it today. He had just left Jerusalem. He had confounded the rabbis. And the rabbis sought to stone him, and he makes his escape, and he leaves. And he's speaking to his, his disciples, and he makes a statement. He says, aren't there 12 hours in the day? If you walk in the light, you will never stumble. Now, if you understand what's happened, again, he, I believe what he's doing is he's making a reference. If you go back again and look at the eternal clock in the heavens, it's just like the pattern here in the earth. He's making a reference to the holy convocation. He's making a reference to the spring equinox and the fall equinox when there's equal night and equal day, and he's letting them know that he has come to fulfill the promises of Yahweh that are vested in these holy convocations. And if you will follow what is written in the luminaries regarding Yahweh's feast and festivals, and you will follow what the Torah says regarding his feast and festivals, you will never walk in darkness. You will always walk in the light. Now, it's interesting to listen to me carefully because those that walk in darkness are going to stumble. Darkness is associated with wrath, and it is not an accident at that simultaneously, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but simultaneously while Sukkot is occurring for you, the wrath of Yahweh is going to be poured out at a point in the future upon the earth, and that should make you want to celebrate Sukkot. Say amen. Now, we're talking about linking the calendar to the gestational cycle, but if you look at the festival cycle, it's actually shorter from Passover to Sukkot is only 180 days. And so, again, I have it written for you in there with the notes. And so, if what I'm doing is making the, the statement that these festivals are, in fact, linked to the gestational cycle of the female, then the math doesn't fit. 180 and 280. So, there's 100 days missing. But if you remember, there, there is a quote-unquote minor festival that occurs at Kislev 25, called the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah, which is probably familiar to more of you, called the Festival of Lights. It's at that particular season when the Messiah would have been conceived. And if you understand the math, again, you have 3 times 30, which gives you 90. And then from the 15th of the month, the full moon, to the 25, you've got 10. 90 and 10 is 100. 100 and 180 gives you 280. So you can see that Yahweh's pattern is consistent. Does that make sense to you? Are y'all getting some of this? And I want to show you. I'll just give you a little bit of an illustration. You may have seen this before, and that's okay. I'm just going to kind of go back over it by repetition, and then we're going to segue in some things that I believe as we look at it that hopefully will cause your mouth to fall open like a four-year-old gopher hole because I believe that Abba is revealing some stuff to us in this last day that is going to put us in a place where we can be protected while the rest of the world is in jeopardy. Are you hearing me? Let's look at the pattern. First in Pesach. Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In a normal ovulation cycle, the female egg appears on the 14th of the month. Guess what? Passover, the 14th, Nisan. Fertilization with the male sperm must take place within 24 hours or else that egg and the potential life that it would have been holding would be flushed out. At sundown on the 14th, beginning the 15th, guess what? Our Messiah, that life flow was planted into the earth, that seed was planted, keeping the time frame with this initial uh, beginning of the female cycle. And so if that seed is planted or dies, as de is depicted by the events of Yeshua's execution, just prior to sundown on Nisan 15, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread would follow that pattern. And now you know why it was imperative. Even the, his disciples came and petitioned the authorities to say, let us get his body down. They had to get his body down before sunset in order to fulfill this cycle. Powerful, powerful. From that time, there is a short indefinite time frame that can be two to six days when that fertilized egg is traveling towards the uterus before, before it's planted into the lining of the uterus wall. And so that takes you to what is referred to as a minor festival, Yom HaBikarim, the day of early first fruits, which occurs during the week of unleavened bread. 
And this festival is the earmark of our Messiah's resurrection. First fruits, based on the cycle, the pattern, Yeshua would have been executed sometime between 3 p.m. and, and uh, 6 p.m., between the evenings, if you will. And so to follow the pattern of three days and three nights, he would have, of necessity, had to have been resurrected sometime between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., three days later, to fulfill the sign of Jonah, okay? And so if you look at the pattern, he's executed on... The 14th, three days later, would have been the 17th. And so once again, you see this minor festival in the gestational cycle being fulfilled. Fifty days later, the embryo makes a remarkable transition inside the, the body of the female where it first becomes recognizable as a living, viable being. Again, coinciding, coinciding with Shavuot or Pentecost. Now let's look at the fall festivals. Most of you realize we just celebrated not too many days back the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. We celebrated, we celebrated Yom Kippur because we believe we have been set free from some of those laws that pertain to going in and wondering if I'm going to make it for the next year because I know the blood of bulls and goats was not sufficient, but the blood of our Messiah, King of creation, that has been applied to the holy place inside this altar here has made an atonement for me forever. Say amen. As long as I stay with between the ditches. The seventh month begins with the Feast of Trumpets, which just so happens to be the first time that the baby is able to fully here inside the babies, inside the mother's womb, guess what? You have on the day of trumpets, you have a great blasting. Why would I need to blast something? I believe so that you can be able to hear. Your hearing becomes fully developed during the seventh month cycles. And so that's why it's imperative for you right now to do what Mark tells us to do. And what is it, Mark chapter 11? No, Mark chapter 4, where it says, pay attention to what you hear. For the measure that you measure it with, it shall be measured unto you. There's a lot of voices in the world right now that are speaking, saying things to you, saying things regarding you, saying things about your future, saying things regarding what's going to happen in your life. And I'm here to tell you that you need to be making some proclamations. Beginning the first of that seventh month, you need to begin to make some proclamations in the world so that it will identify the fact that I am capable of hearing. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel. Yahweh our Elohim. Yahweh is Echad. Yahweh is one. And I'm going to show you that during the seventh month convocation, we can become Echad with him. Are you hearing me? Yom Teruah was a day of proclamation. Yom Teruah, I believe, was the day that Adam, Adam literally spoke, prophetically naming creation in the same way that Yahweh himself, having set the pattern, would have. And so I'm convinced that you and I, because of the fall, we lost that ability to make the proclamations that would create with our word. But because of the last Adam, known as Messiah Yeshua, the ability to make a holy proclamation, the ability to speak a creative word into the, to the earth, into your circumstance, into your life, has been given back to you. And there are some of you who would say, oh, I don't know if I believe that. Well, I'm just going to get very plain with you. You have right now in your life exactly what you've been speaking. If you want to change what's in your life right now, then you've got to change the proclamation that's coming out of your mouth. You've got to start thinking more than just what's in your little scope inside your little circle because that's one of the reasons that we have what we have right now is because we've been so concerned with self and me that I've forgotten to think forward and to think generationally. Abba wants you to change the proclamation out of your mouth so that you can begin to form the generations in front of you. On the 10th of Tishri, the seventh month, we celebrate Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and Shepherd John did a, a, a marvelous job last week. In fact, I was so shocked that he finished before his hour and a half on the climb frame, I just almost lost control when I was you know, going back and looking at it. But I went and looked at these notes on Yom Kippur, and I'm telling you, 
It's the season when the high priest goes into the holies of holies and offers blood for the nation. Think about this. During the seventh month, at this moment in the gestational cycle, while the blood is being applied to the altar throne or the throne altar in, in the heavens, the baby's blood for the first time undergoes such a significant change that it's now able to live outside the womb independent of the oxygen in the mother's blood. Strictly an accident. Somebody during the seventh month goes into the Holy of Holies and changes the condition, the nature of this living entity inside so that we can be able to go into the presence of the Most High and not be dependent on some other host. Hallelujah. The Hebrew word for atonement is kippur. Say that with me, kippur. It has a numeric value of 300, and sometimes we get castigated because we look at the numeric values or gematria. But Hebrew is an alphanumeric language. In fact, you can use the same thing with English and some other languages, but Hebrew was specifically designed as an alphanumeric language. Every Hebrew letter has an, an equivalent number. Every Hebrew letter... Not, not English, not Chinese, not Russian, not Spanish. Only Hebrew has a vibrational frequency that was also a musical tone. Hebrew is the only language that was set into creation that was designed for you to sing in the same pattern that Abba sang creation into existence. And so for you to say that there's no merit to the numeric values, I would say you just don't know. The numeric value of 300 that's associated with Kippur or Kafar is also the same value as the word Yatsar. And that blows my mind because at Yom Kippur, the reason that we can celebrate joyfully is because we know that at this season that we have been formed, Yatsar, we have literally been formed like Creator formed the Adam. Listen to this, it'll blow your mind. And Abba then breathes his breath into the Adam. And I believe his breath was nothing less than the light of creation. And so man became a, an eternal vessel that was created for one purpose. You were created to house the light of Yahweh's presence inside you. However, we know after the fall in Genesis 3, the light on the inside of the man caused him to change physiologically. And so the light that was coursing through the veins of this man congeals or slows down and becomes the blood substance that we know today. In fact, all you have to do is just ask somebody that's in the medical profession, not that they're always right. So you might want to rethink that. But you can actually shine light. You can irritate man's blood and affect physiological changes. Are you listening to me? I submit to you, Adam's blood would have originally been light. What does that have to do with the study of Sukkot? My goodness. Sukkot's all about us gathering together, individual lights, coming together to make a collective light. You're the light of the world. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine unless it causes me problems. Excuse me. Light is an electromagnetic frequency. This blows my mind. That, is, that happens to be visible to the eye of man. You can see light. You can't see all of the color spectrums inside this white light, but they're there nonetheless. Light is literally a reflection of the omnipotent presence of the Creator, which the face of Yahweh no man can look at and see. He understood that. And so what he did, he actually took his presence and he encapsulates it inside his voice and he breathes that light he releases those vibrational frequencies into that man and those vibrational frequencies that were his voice the light of all creation were captured and given a tangible body called the Adam Adam dies because of sin and so there has to of necessity come a last Adam who would also be called the light of the world he was the one that once again encapsulated the tangible light of Yahweh's presence. He was the vibrational frequency walking around the earth, walking around the world, waiting to be released into somebody's life, be healed in the name of the Most High. 
And that's what you have been charged to do. It's not that you don't want to do it. We Most of us simply don't know how to do it. We have an unction inside of us. You come across people all the time that are ill, they're sick, they have certain things going on in their lives, and you, you feel drawn to them. You want to do something, and you feel like sometimes that your hands are tied because you just don't know what. Well, I'll pray for you. I understand that, and the, the, the will is there. But what Abba's about to do, he's about to cultivate something on the inside of his people that's going to cause the intensity of that light. He's going to turn up the wattage. Are you listening to me? And there are going to be some of you that are going to be walking around in the earth and you're going to be releasing Yahweh's words and we're going to see people healed, delivered. You're going to see people raised from the dead. You're going to see the demonic entities cast out. Why? Because the light cannot be hid. If we're hid, then darkness gets the glory. And so if there was ever a season when the earth is going to suffer great darkness, it has to be contrasted by a great light, in my opinion, or else Yahweh cannot be sovereign. Are you hearing me? The root of that word, kippur, is the pay resh stem, and it indicates the fruit of the lips. The letter Kaf appended to the front of it, it indicates title deed, ownership, and authority. It's interesting because pay rich has a numeric value of 280, which gets us, connects us back to the gestational cycle again. Your words release. Your words cause uh, as a life to be instantly released into the earth. Your words were released and conception. I don't care what you, you can say, oh, I really didn't mean that. My goodness. You release the seed. And if there is a receptacle for that seed, listen to me. Conception takes place. We need to guard these words. Amen? It reminds us that Adam and Eve had the ability, Chava, Eve, had the ability to produce offspring simply by the word or the fruit of their lips. And if you look at that Hebrew letter, Kaf, it becomes a certificate of authority that covers us. And they're our children, their children, and all future generations. And so you don't need to be afraid to speak Yahweh's word because there is a supernatural, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient entity who is able to cover over you, and he has sanctioned you. He has given you the authority to release his word in the earth so that you could affect not only where you are right now, you've got to stop limiting the vision of Yahweh in your life. You've got to start thinking forward. The word for Kippur comes from a Hebrew root that actually is translated as cover, to forgive, to reconcile.